Today I'm going to give a presentation about StressNG, which is a tool I've written for stressing systems. So just to let you know, I work for Intel. I'm going to take my Intel hat off and I'm going to put my StressNG hat on today. So anything I say about StressNG has nothing to do with my employer. So this is basically all about the StressNG project and nothing to do with Intel. So um, why do stress testing? Well, it's it's a good engineering practice to test kernels. And um, one of the reasons I wrote Stress and G was basically to thrash kernels and try and find bugs which other software wasn't finding. Um, so there are lots of different, different reasons why we could do um, stress testing. It's to find if the kernel panics under certain loads, if the race conditions, you know, if locking doesn't work. Um, it's also good to test a system to see if it behaves well when the system's under stress, like when you run it low on memory or maybe the disk fills up. Um, you know, sometimes it's not just a kernel issue. If you run low on memory, maybe a daemon crashes because it tries to allocate memory and it hasn't got a memory check to see if you get a null pointer. Things like that, so it's user space as well. Um, it's also good to actually see what happens um, when we stress the system. Does it behave as we expect? Um, under load. I mean, it works fine not under load, but under load, does it still behave in the same way? And um, stress testing is also good. It's good to do stress testing to see if stuff scales well. So a program or a system might run really well with 100 CPUs, but maybe you've got several hundred and you really want to load them up. Does the scheduler behave? Or do programs just not work under that kind of stress? And another good thing about stress testing is you can actually use it to burn, do burn-in tests. So for example, you've got a whole load of new memory in your system. Maybe you just want to stress it for a whole day just to see if you can find memory errors. Or maybe you like your disk. Does your disk actually really work? So um, yeah, so that's the whole thing. So I've, I've got here, this is an elastic band. And stress testing on the kernel is a bit like this. We kind of like stretch it and stretch it. And, st and well, maybe does it, can we do it lots of times? How many times can we do it? Can we hammer the system? Can we break it? And there does come a point where things break and that's the interesting thing. When things break, how do we fix that? So why use stress and G? Well, I'm not saying everyone should use it, but it's a useful tool for some use cases. So already, um, stress and G has been used, and it's um, 60 kernel bugs have been found with it and fixed, which is really cool. Um, and also, people use stress and G to do performance testing and metrics, and it's been used also to kind of test systems to find performance regressions. And so performance improvements um, have ended up in the kernel just because people have been thrashing their system with StressNG. Um, StressNG is also used by um, the kernel zero day performance testing. And um, again, this, this is good to see if there's regressions in like the way memory is allocated, if the memory manager is working correctly or if the scheduler is working correctly. And um, I've had various emails from different silicon vendors saying, oh, this is really cool, Stress and G, we're using this in-house to test our silicon, and we found these bugs with it, or I get people asking me, well, this is not quite working correctly, is it a problem with Stress and G, and we look into it, sometimes it's a kernel, sometimes it's Stress and G, and sometimes it's, it's the early silicon. So, you know, it's been used on, on physical hardware as well. And my previous employer, I used to work for Canonical, and um, we started using Stress and G after it kind of matured a bit, um, to actually hammer the kernels before we released them, just to see if, you know, after we played all, applied all the stable updates and all the extra secret source, you know, the special patches which Ubuntu carries, have we actually broken the kernel? So it was good to give it that kind of fresh testing. And people are also using Stress and G um, in, in, this, in, this, in the big server space and the cloud environment. And um, what's, what's been a surprise to me is um, some kind person um, produce some packaging for, um, oh, names escape me. Sorry, I've got long COVID, so when it comes to nouns, sometimes they just disappear out of my mind. But someone, someone, someone um, packaged up StressNG, and I'm getting like 100,000 downloads of StressNG daily now of people installing it and running it in some environment. So I think that's some cloud vendor or some people in the cloud who are <laughs> stress testing stuff with StressNG. It's quite a surprise to me. Um, also, um, stress and G has been referenced a lot in academic papers. People want to kind of um, do things like measure power, 
um, under load or maybe run like networking with a, with a CPU load to see how that changes performance. So there's a lot of academic research, if you look around, which has been using stress and G, which is very pl pleasing to me because I know that you know, it's helping people in their academic studies to try and improve the kernel. And also, um, stress and G is being used by the Linux kernel performance test tool. So you know, it's, it's nice to see it being used. So let's, let's get a quick bit of history. So about 10 years ago, I was working on enabling laptops for um, the, the Ubuntu project. And we found that under some loads, um, CPUs got hot. And because the fan wasn't working correctly or there were poor thermal designs, um, processors were getting up to like 100 degrees and then just shutting down. It was like, yeah, that's not great kind of user experience. And um, fortunately, Intel had created a tool called Thermal Demon, which I packaged up for Debian, got into Ubuntu. And that helps. It's a really cool tool for monitoring, you know, thermal overrun and just controlling the machine. But I really wanted to see if it worked correctly under a lot of load. So I started, I started looking for tools which could do it. And the stress tool was there, and there's other CPU burning tools. But I thought, let's try and write my own just to try and squeeze a little bit more power consumption to see if I can really break the um, break system, make it crash because it ran out of, well, it, it hit the thermal maximum. So that's where it all came from. Basically, I wanted to set fire to laptops. That was my, that was my aim. And um, yeah, so in complement with the Intel Thermal Demon, it was one of those things where I could stress a system and see if Thermal Demon was doing the stuff. Um, that was 10 years ago. Um, since then, I've added a few more little stresses. Um, so it's kind of complete in one, one way, but I'm always happy to add more stress tests. But I think it's kind of reached feature completeness and probably it's got feature creep now. Um, so what does stress and D do? Well, it, Primarily, one of, the, one of the main things is to exercise the CPU. So you can exercise the CPU on exercise interrupts or the cache, structuring cache. You could do integer floating point operations. I've been recently adding the last few years vector um, math operations to really try and um, exercise stuff like x86 processes. I, I've written the code so it uses um, um, target clones in GCC. So you, when you build it, you have multiple versions for different processes. So when you compile it, you get code which is you know, genatively for your processor. And when you run it, you get really tight, optimized code. Um, so yeah, in, um, CPU-wise, it exercised a lot of features there. Um, some kind person prov um, provided me a GPU stressor, which is really good because I know nothing about GPUs. So that's cool. Um, and also on the kernel side, um, I started to look at um, not just thrashing the CPU, but I thought it'd be really good if we could start exercising kernel interfaces, so system calls, um, things which are user-facing, like SysFS, ProcFS, and, and so forth, and in, in devices. So Stress and G now covers the majority of the system calls. I'm constantly looking for new system calls which add features and I've introduced those into Stress and G. So it's kind of an ongoing task to keep Stress and G fresh for the latest kernel. So Paul Tux. You know, part of stress testing is to give the kernel a bit of a headache. So I have stresses which allocate lots of memory, you know, push, pushing your resources. I've got stresses which repeatedly do the same thing over and over, or a mix of the same things. Because you know, doing something once is fine, but what happens if you do it millions of times? Oh, there's a memory leak. You know, you can find bugs that way. And also, I've got um, a mix of stressors. You don't have to just one, run one at a time. You can run a whole mix. And that way, you can make stress and you juggle all sorts of um, kernel resources, like memory allocation, hitting the, you know, the, the data cache, uh, you know, the file system, the whole lot. So, you know, Paul Tux doesn't like this. So then, what is a stressor? Stress and G has these things called stressors. A stressor really is a very, very simple thing. There's an initial, initialization phase, which is optional, and then the st stress phase. And all that is is there's a little do loop, and it checks if, I, if the process needs to continue or not. Um, it does a bit of work. It increments a little BOGO op counter, and the BOGO op is a bogus operation. It's just like, 
a way of measuring how much has been done. It's totally bogus. It's kind of a metric, but you know, it, take it like that. It's not accurate, but it's nice to see the machines doing something. And um, if you get um, an alarm, so you run the stress test, say a minute. SIG alarm occurs, and stress and G that bails out from that loop. So it's very simple. Um, and sometimes the stress loops take a bit of computation, so I put yields in to try and make it um, terminate it quickly rather than you have to wait for a long time on slower processes. And then finally, there's a cleanup phase. Now, what, that's a very simple model, but the, the little while loop can be a bit more complicated than that. Stress and G can then fork other children, or you can create threads for a bit more activity. So when you see one instance of a stressor, generally that is just one forked child, but some stress cases, it can fork off others and you can have multiple processes or multiple threads running. Um, and that's really up to the stressor to maintain and handle all of that. So basically that's it. A stressor is that. And when you see BOGO ops, it's just how many times it's gone around the loop. So running stressors, well, there are two kind of categories of options, and I use the GNU long ops, so um, dash dash for every option, really. So generally, when you run a stressor, you specify the stressor name and how many instances you want to run. So you could have to like, say stress memmap stressor one, and that'll be one instance of that running. Or you could say zero, and zero says, how many CPUs have you got online? Run the n instances of that stressor. Um, and you can also specify other things like number of BOGO ops you want to run. So you say, run this stressor for a thousand loops. So it'd be like, um, for example, the memmap stressor, again, be memmap hyphen ops a thousand. That's all it is, do a thousand iterations. It doesn't matter how long that will take. It, when it gets to a thousand iterations, it will complete. And then stressors themselves have lots of extra features. So there's per stressor options to go with those stressors. And then there are global options, so you can specify how long to run your stress test for. There are options to say, when you run this test, add verification to make sure the test is actually working correctly and you're getting the expected results. And that's kind of cool when you're doing things like CPU tests or vector math tests or disk I.O. tests and so forth. Um, also, there's the thing, metrics, which gives you the number of BOGO ops being run. And for some specific um, stresses, there are options to show you a little bit, little bit more detail. Sometimes it says how, how long it takes to execute a system call or the latency of something. So you know, each stressor might have extra metrics. And as I say, these metrics are like a rule of thumb. They, like, they're not, they might not be 100% accurate. So if you're running stress and G on, on one system and you run it stress and G on another and you look at the BOGO ops or the metrics, you go, no, oh, they're a bit different. You need to make sure, number one, you're running the same version of Stress and G. You've got to compare apples with apples rather than apples and pears. It's using the same libc. And you know, then there's the other stuff like when you're comparing kernels, you know, make sure they're compiled with the same options or whatever. So Stress and G metrics are fine, but only take them so far. You know, there is a bit of variability. And like when you compile it with different compilers, you get different results. And different versions of Stress and G might have bug fixes or improvements or optimizations. So between releases of Stress and G, the metrics might be different. So buyer beware, make sure you're comparing results for the same, same version of Stress and G when you're comparing machines. On machines. Um, yeah, there's options for logging, there's options for collecting perf events, there's, there's many, many more op global options. So this gets the nitty gritty. How do we actually run this? Well, here's an example where I'm running four matrix stresses, three virtual memory stresses, two memory thrasher stresses, and I run them all in parallel for one minute. So as you can see there, each, each of these stresses is just a child process running on its own. And then after a minute, they get terminated. Now, when you specify one minute, that's the minimum runtime. Sometimes things run a little bit longer. For example, if you're running a disk type based test, sometimes it does a setup phase, does the test, and it has to remove lots of files and things. So it might run for more than one minute. But the metrics are always based on the one minute time you've given, rather than start up and finish time. So let's look at another example. Now, the problem is there's 300 examples I could give you because there are 300 stresses. 
I'm not going to bore you to death with that today. So here's some examples. I'll quickly run through them. Um, here we are running stress and G on um, the eight instances here of a matrix stressor. And that, that just populates a bit of memory, fills it with data, and does various matrix operations. But it's a really cool test because it exercises compute, cache, and memory. And this one generally makes most processes quite toasty and hot. Um, I set a timeout for five minutes, and the timeout can be like minutes, hours, seconds, days if you want, or even months. You know, there's, there's, if you want to kill your machine and run it for months, please do. Um, and there's an, another option here, thermal stat one, and every second on the log, you'll see the thermal measurements from the machine if, I can, if Stress and G can actually read those thermal measurements. Um, here's another example. The next one is I'm um, running two instances of the vector mass stressor, floating point stressor, running two instances of that, four instances of the CPU stressor, run it for 200 seconds, and also provide thermal zone information. So that will show you all the different thermal zones and see how they're, so you can see like how the core is getting on, how um, a, you know, ACP thermal zone is reporting and stuff. So you can see how hot your machine is getting, um, which is kind of interesting. You can see where um, different stress tests exercise machines in different ways, and you can see how close it gets to that thermal cutoff. But there are lots more stresses. I've got stuff which does this is the um, kernel AFALG um, API. I've got stuff which says atomic operations, branching, B searching. As I say, the list is, is very long, so please consult the manual. But, you know, we, we, I tried to make it so I test everything CPU related. But if you've got more ideas, please let me know. Memory stressing is interesting because um, stress and is not like um, has full physical access, it just uses virtual memory. Um, so one of the very simple tests is a VM stressor. On this one, zero says stress um, for n CPUs on the machine run an in, one uh, run n instances of the VM stressor. I've got verification enabled, so it will go through the VM stressor will allocate memory. It will then bit twiddle the memory in various different ways, and then it will sanity check that to see if the bits have been set correctly. So you know it's good for a soak test if you think you've got dodgy memory run this test for several hours, and maybe you'll, you'll see it throw up issues. Um, I've got another test here called Memory Stressor. This one here benchmarks reads and writes, so it does various read and writes, different sizes, and things like x86, it does um, more x86-specific um, writes where you can actually write through to memory and, and ignore the cache. So that's kind of useful for benchmarking your system to see if your memory is configured correctly. And the next one is more of a kind of a, a way of seeing if you can break the kernel or break applications when memory runs low. So I run a break stressor, which keeps on ex expanding the heap. Um, it also runs a stack stressor, which keeps on expanding the, the stacks by just pushing more, and stuff, more, more stuff on the stack. Um, a big heap stressor, which just does lots of mallocs. And a noon pipe stressor. So the interesting thing about pipes is you can tell the kernel how big a pipe you want. And if you run thousands of, <laughs> or hundreds of instances of processes doing that, you can run really low on memory, and then the kernel starts to kind of um, proactively try to um, you know, get more memory, and it might oom processes in, the, in, 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 the, in, in, in doing so when memory gets low. So these are pretty good for running when you've got a system where you want to see if demons or so forth crash because they're trying to allocate memory which isn't there and they haven't handled it properly. And um, you know, it's also good to just see how, how well you can crash the virtual memory system and swap and see if the kernel can handle really, really pained stress loads on memory. Um, quickly, I'll go through some more. So you've got some stress tests on um, networking. So this just creates lots of um, UDP, UDP packets. Um, and the next option is a socket stressor. And as you can see, this stress test has lots of different options. So you can say, I want to use IPv6. Um, I want to use um, this, uh, the loopback interface, although that's the default. Um, and you say, I want to use um, TCP IP, and I want to do um, streaming. So yeah, there's lots of options. Consult the manual, but stress and is really super flexible for configuring different types of tests. 
depending on, on the stressor you're using. And again, there's, there's lots of these network type stressors. Um, one more, um, file systems. It's really good to hammer a file system. Um, so you know, you've got your new um, ext4, you know, put your new kernel on, there's, there's, some, there's some new ext4 features you want to test. Well, run StressNG against it. So in this example, I've got an IO mix stressor, and this simulates lots of kind of a mix of IO operations like short, small reads, long reads, random seeking, sequential streaming of writes, sequential streaming of reads, you know, a whole lot of stuff there. Um, but the other cool thing is you can actually put in um, the smart op option, and that tests if the device has any smart errors occurring. So, so smart is this feature which allows you to check the hardware to see if the hardware reports any faults on the device, for example, bad blocks and so forth. So you know, the, the smart option is good for testing hardware. And um, there's an option there, temp path. You can actually specify which path you want to exercise. You can mount a file system and then hammer that to death using the temp path option. Um, oh, I've got one more example there, and that's the reverse I.O. And this one's really cool because it creates a file right at the end and works backwards and does various seeks backwards and writes very varied sized files and creates lots of extents. So, you know, Good to thrash this file system and <laughs> creating lots of extents just to see if that works correctly. Um, yeah, and again, there's lots, lots of other file system stresses to exercise. Very simple things like, you know, does Chermod work when you do it thousands of times? You know, see if we can do things like force locking problems when you run things concurrently. Um, so yeah, I mean, the list goes on. There are numerous file-based stress options. Um, and then finally, I, I said stress and G, I've designed it to try and test kernel interfaces. So um, I've got sysfs um, tests which traverse all of sysfs, sysfs and try and do reads and various operators like mem maps if you can do that and various illegal options which you're not supposed to do just to see if that creates problems. Um, and I exercise procfs and also the devices. So for devices, it will go through find the device and then try and perform various IOCTLs on that device, some illegal, some legal, just to see if we can force breakage with multiple concurrent open exercise closed type cycles. And then I've got a various um, system core exercises. There's one which does ENOSYS, which tries to do core system calls which don't exist. And you might find this a strange one, but we ran this on a risk system and we found out that some system calls weren't wired up correctly and ENOSYS was actually causing problems. So that's kind of cool. Um, I've got a system valve test, which just does system calls with invalid val values, just to see if we can trip system calls or if anything comes out of the kernel log saying, hey, you've done this wrong. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen stuff where you've called something wrong lots of times and you end up spamming the kernel log. That could be a denial of service attack. So it's good to just hammer these type of interfaces to see if we're breaking anything. Uh, I've got tests to exercise the VDSO and, and benchmark that. It tells you how quick a VDSO call is. And in x86 syscall mechanism. So lots of different ways of exercising system calls. OK, I could go on and on and on. But I won't. You're very fortunate. You don't have to listen to any more stress test type of examples. Because there's a manual. I've written a 90-page ma manual which explains every stress test and all the different options. So please feel, to, feel free to refer to that. And if you've got any questions like, Colin, can you test X, Y, and Z? Please read the manual first before sending me an email, because I get lots of people asking me that. I think, well, just read the manual. I've spent a lot of time writing at the manual. So, so yeah. yeah. And StressNG has over 900 options, because a lot of these stress tests have their own individual options. So there is a lot of tunability. There's lots of configuration types where you can control StressNG. So please, RTFM. Right, so a little bit more is some of these stressors you see, I, I had like memory-based stressors or file-based stressors. And I've I put these in there, a name called a class. So um, a file system class will exercise lots of different file system options. Or a, or a CPU class will test or exercise the CPU. So it's all the different stressors which exercise the CPU are in a CPU class. Um, so, generally, every stressor is at least in one class. 
but some stresses can be in one or more classes. For example, um, if you've got a stress test which is calling the operating system a lot, while it's also doing memory type stuff, it might be under, say, for example, a VM test class, and it might be under an operating system class. So there's a bit of overlap there. So how do we use this? Well, we say stress and G, class. You specify the class you want to exercise. You specify how long you want to run each test for. And then you say, run all those things sequentially, and you specify how many instances of that stressor you want to run. So an example here, run all the virtual memory tests, run them one by one, run eight instances of each of those tests, and just run them through to the end. And I haven't specified, oh yeah, run, run each, each time it's, each test is being run, just run it for one minute. Um, so yeah, um, there was the example of running a you know, network class, uh, two instances of every network stressor, run it for one minute each time. And recently I put in a new option, the with option, so you can say with and list the number of uh, different stresses you want to exercise. So for this example, I'm saying run the VM, cache, memfresh, and memmap stressors sequentially, one by one, eight instances of each one, and run each test for one minute. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. That's five times one minute, so it's a five-minute total duration. But it's quite flexible because you can give a list of lots of different things you can run and mix. And another new feature I've added is the perm option, which allows you to do permutations of those stresses. So I'll quickly go to the, um, the second one where I say stress and G perm eight with, so I'm running here the break, big, hap, big heap and stack stressor, and it will run a permutations of those. So first of all, it will run the break stressor, then it will run the break stress and big heap, then big heap, and then stack, and then break. And stack. So you just go through every permutation and exercise those. So that's a really good way of like doing a thorough thrash test with a mix of stresses. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's useful, but I thought, you know, it's an, uh, yeah, another thing we can do. Um, okay, one other thing is, as I said, stressors have lots of options. So some stressors just do one thing, and just that's all they do. Other stressors have lots of different things they can do. And those are called methods. So, for example, the VM stressor has lots of different ways of exercising memory. So there's lots of different methods out. I, I must be about 20 or so. And by default, each stressor will go through each method one by one. So it covers them all and, and, and just round robin loops that. But you can actually say, no, I just want to run, for example, one method, please, rather than going through them. So that's what the VM, that's what the method kind of option is. Here we're saying, run the VM stressor and just do bit flipping, please. And you say, oh, I, I want to cover 90% of my memory and please verify. So that's what the that first example is. And for example, the CPU stressor, again, that's got quite a lot. It's got must, must be 40 or 50 different stressor options in that, stressor methods, I mean. So here's an example where I run um, the CPU method div 64. So that just does 64 bit divisions, chooses a random number, just goes through millions of those operations and verifies that to make sure the vision actually works. It's very basic, but you know you, you can focus exactly on one type of stressor method to hammer your system. Um, as I said, there's some extra global options. So I said verify, do sanity checking. Um, I've got an um avoid option, so if you're using lots of memory, you can say Try to avoid ooming the system. Just maximize your memory stressing, but try not to cause any ooms. I've got an option, K-log check, which looks at the kernel messages to see if any, any potential bad errors come up, like um, timeouts, you know, uh, hang checks and stuff. Um, the other thing is um, all these stresses at, at, um, use random number generator, use a random number generator, generator to mix up results. But sometimes you want repeatability. So I've got a no RAND seed option, which doesn't do random seeding, but it uses an initial seed value, which is never, never changes. So you can keep on repeating the stress test rather than getting different results. Uh, there's an option to say exclude. So you can say, I want to run this whole class of maybe file system stresses, but please exclude. And then you can give a list of stresses you don't want to run. And rather jokingly, I added that Ignite CPU option, 
which basically overrides all the stuff which um, uh, um, Intel's thermal demon tries to do, just keeps on hammering those interfaces, cranking stuff up to the maximum, continually doing that while you're running your, your um, CPU stresses. So it's just a case of just you know, run that as root, run that with that option, and we try and make the, the, the CPU catch fire. Hopefully it doesn't. Um, also, the task set option allows you to do CPU affinity to pin tests to certain CPUs. So that's cool in like NUMA type things when you want to pin it up to you know, a particular package. So as I said earlier, um, Bogo Ops, micro benchmarking. Now, do not do this. Do not say, Colin, when I run micro benchmarking, I'll get 3% difference. What's gone wrong? Caveat emptor, buyer beware that the um, bogo ops thing is, is particularly bogus. It's just a kind of general feel of how much throughput you've got on a test. Now, there are some people, <coughs> Pharonix, for example, who, who exercise stuff and say, well, the latest such and such processor, you're getting a 3% regression on this. It's like, no, just don't use this as a micro-benchmarking tool as gospel truth. It isn't. It's just a general idea of how much throughput you've got. But you can see some, some, of, the, some of the benchmarks I've got like for the M-Lock stressor, it tells you how many nanoseconds a typical M-Lock call takes within this test scenario. You know, it's, it's, it's just a good, quick way of checking if there are any regressions. So please, as I say, beware when you use this option. Do not complain or grumble if it gives you bad results, but say hooray if it gives you some idea that you've got a regression. Okay. <laughs> um, one other option is perf. So you can run this as root or non-root. If you run this as, as a root, you get more perf metrics. But the perf allows you to kind of get some idea of what's going on inside your processor, like how many CPU cycles the test is using, how many branch misses you've got, things, you know, option, you can see what's happening on your cache. So it's a good way of just kind of getting a feel of how your system's behaving with a particular stressor. And, you know, it's good. You move to a different kernel, run the perf option. You might identify some regression performance. You go, oh, yeah, I'm getting more or decache stalls, there's something going on here, and you can investigate further. So it's a crude but simple way of just seeing how your system's performing. Um, finally, scaling. This is a big thing for me. I've been recently looking at how well particular stress tests scale when you, add, uh, when you load big systems. Um, so here we've got an example of the message stressor, and this is just creating messages which go from a, one process to another, so child and parent, just talking to each other with little messages going back and forth, and, oh, it's not scaling that well. Well, that's not great. So um, how do we fix that? So I've been looking at this one and found out that the CFS scheduler, when we, when we have lots of CPUs and it's really busy and you're doing thousands of context switches, most of the time it's being wasted looking for, um, scanning for an idle CPU. It's like, yeah, that's not so great. But we, I think there's a known feature of CFS. Um, but, yeah, you know, you, you can run these type of things across multiple... Um, CPUs, so you see run stress and G with one instance, then two instances, three instances, run it like that, gather the BOGO ops metrics, plot it, and you can see if it scales correctly. If it doesn't, yay, we found a problem, can we fix that? So. Okay, now the other thing is, stress and G, I've tried to make it super easy to build, right? So you don't need to install any dependencies to build it, apart from having a GCC make and or all your favorite compiler hardware. But if you want more features, it's a really good idea to install the dependencies. But all the dependencies are written in the README for um, you know, RHEL, um, Ubuntu, um, SUSE, and so forth. So if you want to build a full, complete stress in G, install all the dependencies. And at build time, when you type make, it will detect, detect automatically detect if certain libraries exist, or certain kernel features exist, or certain compiler features exist, depending on which compiler you are using, and it will generate a stress and G tuned for that environment. Now you can either install it using your favorite distro, you know, apt get install stress and G, or yum, blah, 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 because I can't remember yum. Um, bear in mind, stress and G is being, I update it every month, so it might be out of date. Um, so I've got a Docker image, which is the thing I forgot earlier, and I said I couldn't remember what it's called. So I made a Docker image of um, StressNG, and that gets daily builds, get the latest fresh build, 
And that seems to be popular, as I say, I'm getting 100,000 downloads a day on that, so that's a bit crazy. Um, but yeah, make, build, and the config part where it detects what features you've got can work in parallel as well. So um, it does the config pretty quickly. Okay, so what drives my development of stress in G? Well, number one, I love testing systems. I love finding bugs, and I try and fix them if I find them, but I'm not that great, but at least I can report them upstream if I don't know how to fix them or have a stab at fixing problems. Um, new features, you know, there's, there's always another system call appearing somewhere in the kernel. There's always extra features adding, being added to devices, and you know, new stuff is landing in the kernel all the time. I try and keep track of that, and I try and write regression, uh, stresses for that. Um, I also use GCOV on each new kernel. So I build the kernel, and I run stress on G. I've got a um, script which mounts lots of different file systems and does stress testing across all of that. And after, um, I think it's 14 hours of grinding through, I get GCOV results, and I can actually then start to see the holes in the testing of stress and G and try and formulate different types of stress to, to exercise those paths. Um, new processor features, you know, as I say, working Intel, this is my Intel hat quickly, new features appear, so I try and add tests for those. I also keep track of stuff like what's happening in the risk in, environment as well and so forth, you know. But if people got new ideas which need to be tested, send me patches or give me ideas, you know, things to test. And kernel bugs, I look through the, um, the kernel logs and see if there are any easy to, easy to use reproducers which can be used to test old kernels and I try and put those in occasionally to stress and see if they look interesting and worthwhile. Uh, and guess what, people ask me to put stresses in as well. I say, Colin, this doesn't work, can you do this? And sometimes I add features to existing stressors or sometimes I write a new stressor. And very often I get people sending me a whole new stressor, and that for me is great because they're domain experts in the area. For example, the GPU stressor, I know nothing about GPUs, but some kind person sent me a, a um, code for that, and now we can now exercise GPUs. So that's really cool. So test coverage, over the years, how has that changed? Well, when I started this project eons ago, it feels like, I had a bit of coverage and I thought, well, that's kind of cool. But as I keep on adding features, the coverage in the kernel has increased and increased. And it's just a never-ending task of <laughs> trying to plug those holes and try and test more and more features. But you know, it's good that we've got a metric that we can actually see how far we're getting. And I feel like you know, it's progressing. So it's not going backwards, and I'm happy about that. So portability. Stress and G originally was a Linux-only project, because I thought, you know, I'm working on Ubuntu Linux-only. But over time, I started adding portability shims in just to make, so I, make sure I could actually test older kernels, newer kernels. And then people were saying, well, it'd be really good if we could build it with Clang. So I changed, there's lots of GCCisms, which I've also tried to make build with Clang. And then while I was working on that, um, it was suggested I should make it so it can build with older versions, newer versions of different compilers. So, as a kind of like, I don't know, the masochist in me, I don't know, I've, got, I've tried to make it so it builds with lots of different compilers and it will auto-sense if the compiler can do certain things. So GCC has got lots of really fantastic um, attributes. You can do an these annotations and things. You can tune the code really well. And same with Clang. Um, so I've tried to use those. So lots of features if it's supported. If you're, if you're using a thing like a portable C compiler and it doesn't have that feature, it won't build that in, but at least it builds. Um, when I do my release testing, I test it on Linux and not just one distro, I test it on a whole range of distros. And for example, Debian, I test it on at least six releases. So I go way back in the past to make sure stuff doesn't break on ancient releases of Debian. Um, I check it on BSD, all the different BSD flavors. I so stress and G builds and tests on Solaris type flavors, on Minix, OSX, Debian, I'm uh, sorry, on, on GNU Herd, although that doesn't work very well. I'm always crashing that. And Hayoku as well. So, you know, if it's POSIX and you've got a GCC or Clang or a compiler, which is kind of okay, you should be, probably be able to build StressNG and run it. You might not have all the features, but it should work. And if it doesn't, let me know and I'll try and figure it out because I want it to be portable. And architectures, well, being a Debian person, I've got lots of virtual machines running. Um, emulations of different processes. So before I do a release, I make sure it works on a whole host of architectures, not only compiles, 
but runs through my regression tests. And there might be one or two things which just don't work because the architecture is a bit broken or whatever, but most of the time I will not ship S um, stressing to you if I have funny build warnings or com compilation errors. So a release takes me about two and a half days. I test with 100 virtual machines. So I'm pretty confident when I push a release, it should be quite good. But I'm human and I make mistakes. I also push stress and G through static analyzers like um, Coverty Scan. Um, I use um, Clang Scan Build. I use CPP Check to make sure all the if-death paths work. So as a kind of engi software engineering project, I try and make it as good as I can. And I know that I'm 40, I'm a human being, and I make mistakes. So, you know, there we go. So, um, manual page. Um, there's a nice page manual. It describes everything. Some things are not as much detail as I'd like, but I don't want to make the manual a 400-page treaty. So it's, it's enough as you need. But if you need to know more information, drop me a line, and I can explain things in more depth. One thing I'm going to work on is a quick start guide because 90 pages is too much to wade through. I just want people to get up and running with stress and G. Um, when I was working for the Ubuntu project, I did write a quick reference guide so you can get started with that. It's not authoritative and it's a bit out of date. Okay, um, that's about it. Very quick, you know, spin through stress and G. Um, any questions? Test. Uh, do you have a, a random option? A so random? Yeah, so you can do stress and G random and then it starts running a random test? Yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a random option which will then choose out of the 310 stresses. All, all the stresses. And it will, just, it will just pick random ones. You can. Um, That's cool. I, to try and remember this, I think you can specify how many stresses you want to run. So if you do random like eight, It'll pick okay. ran eight random stresses out of the mix and then run them. Can you say a random zero and then runs uh, uh, without, until you cancel it? Sorry? Uh, can you say random zero so it runs forever until you cancel it? Like a way to generate random stress test for a long time? No, it would just, it would just pick out, you know, when you, when you start it off, it will pick out a mix of random stresses and just run those stresses and until you stop it. Okay. Yeah, but you know, it's one of these tools you can say run it for one minute and then do random again and it'll pick a different random mix. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so you have lots of tests and lots of options. So are you like running those every all every day or something, or how does it work? Sorry, I. I, I... You have lots of tests and lots of options. So are you running them all? No. Uh, every no. kernel release, or do you prioritize them somehow? Or? So um, the whole release phase is actually a very interesting, because um, I can't test everything on all the different architectures and all the virtual machines, because it just takes too long. So normally my development process is to keep on adding new features, and then when it gets close to the release date, I then start testing, the build testing them on different architectures, which you know, starts taking the time, and then I find their issues, and I just keep on iterating around on that. And then I get a, a, a final um, kind of a release candidate, which I then run all the tests on, and I've got some bash scripts which run a whole load of options. There's, um, there's one I use for the kernel coverage. And I, I can't remember the name of it, and I use it daily. Isn't that awful? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a script which will go through and run lots of different permutations of different options. But if you look in the stress and G um, root um, development, uh, if you look at the stress and G repo, there's a couple of bash, bash scripts there which will do that kind of fresh testing on lots of different options for the regression test phase. But life's too short. I can't test all the options, all combinations. So. You also highlighted that some of the tests have scalability issues. Is mm -hmm. it like all the tests, or is there some... No, some, 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 well scale, the... some scale really well, and it's quite impressive. Like, for example, the CPU stressor, that scales quite well. Um, other tests where there's locking, there's always going to be issues with scaling. Um, is there some way to identify the tests that have, if one is interested in scalability problems, is no, there the some only, way to identify the, the ones that The only way to do it, on the way, with that graph, the only way I did it was like, you know, I've got, say I've got 128 CPUs, I just run stress and G 128 times. 
And each time I specify one CPU, pin it, you know, use the task um, set option to pin it to one CPU, then two CPUs to pin it to CPUs. I just scale it up like that, let it run. You know, some of these tests only run, you know, only need to run it for 10 or 15 seconds. So within like 15, 20 minutes, you've got all the scalability metrics. And I just scrape for the output log. Um, each of the log fields in Stress and G you can grep for. So you say, I want to grep for the metrics information, and then you can take column number nine or whatever, which is the number of BOGO ops. Uh, you know, and you can just paste that into a spreadsheet. So it's, that's how I do that. Um, I have a question. You said that depending on the version, uh, the test might change a bit. Have you considered making a stable output or maybe even easier to parse. Output, Sorry, stable. A stable output, uh, like yeah. so that if you update a stressor, uh, at least you can compare between versions. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that if you if you are wrapping, let's say I'm wrapping stress energy, uh, I want to run different stressors. Um, I want to know if I can update stress energy without breaking parsing, for instance. Yeah. So. Um, it's difficult to do. The, uh, the, the issue I found originally was I tried to make everything the stable metric, but then you, you kind of notice, oh, that can be optimized, or it doesn't quite well work well with this particular processor. So I'll just change this compilation option, or, oh, oh look, the compiler now supports this. And it's really difficult to have metrics which are stable, um, especially when you've got moving targets like libc changes, for example, you know, even things like people optimize, oh, how dare they? People optimize things like Strickholm for whatever. Like, <laughs> you know, so, so there's lots of different layers where things change, which are out of your control, it, be it compiler optimization, libc, or the kernel. So for a stable metric, it's, it's, it's a nightmare process. And I ha you know, this is why I say, if you're going to run these tests for metrics, make sure you're testing with the same libc, the same version of stress ng, and then you can compare kernels. Or if you're testing hardware, it makes all the kernels the same. You know, then you can compare. And for regressions, just install the old kernel, run the new kernel, you know, build and test. Uh, you know, I'm sorry it's kind of that basic, but we, we, you see any way of comparing apples with pears, really. Yeah, but, um, that, that's one, one aspect of it. That's the stability of the test. But then there's the stability of the output parsing. Does it have a JSON output, for instance? All right, the output, I've, I have not broken, hopefully, the output over years. I try and make the output, you know, I don't try, you know, I try, I try and make send, it, I'll send things your yeah, way. Yeah, I try and make it machine passable. But there's also, there's a um, YAML option, so you can dump out all the metrics into a YAML file, so you can machine parse that. So, you know, that, that's kind of standard. So I, I, I only add extra fields to that. I don't remove stuff. And that's one thing I was really careful when I started the whole project. I wanted to make it plug-in compatible with the original stress, stress test. And then over time, it's kind of grown. So, yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, one thing I found uh, particularly fruitful in the past for finding bugs in a lot of different places was to do um, CPU hot plug. So you turn mm -hmm. it, you take CPUs offline and you put them back on and you do it randomly. Um, do you have a stressor for that? I, I do. Yeah, it's called ah. CPU online. I, I looked in the manual just now. I didn't see it. All right. Uh, yeah, it, it, might, it might have been near the CPU option. If you look, there's a CPU online stress, which you can then specify a term on and off, but it's it, it basically rapidly does it. It doesn't like wait a second, whatever. But it's kind of useful because you run that with other stress tests, <laughs> and exactly. all sorts of strange bugs sometimes pop out. So, so did you find a lot of bugs with that in particular um, that you remember? Um, there's only one issue which was outstanding, and that's like offlining CPU zero, which kind of worked on some kernels and doesn't on others. So, um, you know, it's, the problem is, is I can't test every combination of everything. So. You know, I add features, but I've never done like, does it break with the current kernel with every option? So, yeah, try it and see. You know, I think I think that's the option. Yeah. All right. Just because you mentioned the hot plug stressing test, I do actually have a simple script that just basically 
destroyed a hot plug so bad that it inspired Thomas to go rewrite the hot plug code. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So it basically what it did, it did basically was a simple thing. It did a binary count. So I just created a mask and said, okay, hot plug CPU zero, now mm. hot plug CPU one, now hot plug CPU zero and one, then hot plug you know, CPU three, then hot plug CPU one, three, then two, three, then one, two, three, and just kept there. And it basically crashed every single kernel I ever ran this on. Yeah. <laughs> It, so, but it does. It works now with Thomas's update. So thank you. <laughs> so, so the other, the other thing is, you know, you can run multiple instances. Okay. <laughs> you, you can run multiple instances of that stressor. So you can have, you know, yeah. n running across all CPUs, online and offline, in them randomly. <laughs> Complete yeah. nightmare. That actually, just doing the binary thing was enough to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's not that I hate the kernel. I love the kernel, and I want to make it better, and that's why I wrote stress and t to force out bugs. Um, so you're running each stressor in a separate process. Is there also a way to have one process iterate quickly over different stressors, so that you don't have the, the scheduling granularity to switch between stressors threads? Yeah, so this, this is the, one of the fundamental problems. I, when I wrote stress and g, I really wanted it to be portable. So I've, I've, you know, I started the create a child, does it stuff finishes. But there are some stresses which create lots of threads, rip down threads, create threads. So look at the documentation, you'll see that there are some stresses which do all sorts of dynamic thread kind of manipulation. But I, you know, it's not smart. The problem is if you start trying to make the thing smart, it becomes difficult to be portable. So. Cool. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, if <laughs> if if you want more, I've got I've got some business cards which have got the QR code and my email address. So you know, you don't have to remember it here. I can you know, chat to me and I'll give you some more more info. Thank you. <laughs>